Well, welcome everybody to this online event organised by the International Service for Human Rights in partnership with HRCNet. Uh, the purpose of which, of course, is to very warmly welcome the new President of the Human Rights Council, Ambassador Nazat Shamim Khan, uh, as well as to say thank you and to farewell the former President of the Council, Ambassador Elizabeth Tihi Fisselberger. Uh, I'm also very pleased to be joined by members of HRCNet, uh, the, the Executive Director of Forum Asia, Shamini Dashni Kalimutu, and the Senior Advocacy and Research Officer of Defend Defenders, Estella Kabachwezi. Uh, before we get into the substance of proceedings, some housekeeping. Uh, we have simultaneous interpretation of this event in French and in Spanish. You can choose the language option uh, from the interpretation button at the bottom of your screens. I'd also remind the panelists to please stay on the English channel. Uh, we also have English captioning, which you can activate with the closed captions button, which you'll find again at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this event is being live streamed on ISHR's YouTube YouTube ch channel in all three languages, English, French, and Spanish. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions to both the current and former presidents of the Human Rights Council. And if you do have questions, then please use the Q&A function uh, for that segment at the end of this event. For many rights holders, for many victims of violations, and for many human rights defenders, the UN Human Rights Council provides the last or the only opportunity and platform to secure international attention and support for their vital work, to ensure accountability for perpetrators and to achieve justice for victims and to achieve uh, their vision of a world which is more fair, equal and sustainable. In order to fulfil this high calling, however, we need the Council to be credible, effective and accessible to everyone. We also need a council in which states demonstrate leadership, in which states take principled action, and in which states ensure that they themselves and others live up to their responsibilities and expectations and fully cooperate with the council's mechanism. In order to demonstrate leadership and take principled action, we urge states to apply objective criteria in addressing situations of concern and to pay particular attention to attacks or restrictions against human rights defenders as an early warning sign of more widespread or systematic violations. The COVID-19 pandemic affected us all very significantly. It certainly affected the work of the Human Rights Council and in particular, the access and participation of civil society, which was drastically decreased and impeded due to COVID-19 related restrictions, as well as related efficiency measures. There were some very positive developments though. The current practice, for example, of video statements by NGOs marks an important opportunity to enable those affected directly by human rights violations to speak to the council. And we would urge that those continue beyond the COVID-19 exceptional measures. 2021 is also a year in which the council will continue to focus on the issue of efficiency. And we would strongly uh, urge that uh, efficiency measures be evaluated in terms primarily of the Council's accessibility and effectiveness, rather than by measures of uh, financial uh, analysis or by measures of, uh, of, of time. The real questions need to be the accessibility and the effectiveness of the Council in fulfilling its mandate. Of course, in order, in order for this to be achieved, the Council needs to be accessible to rights holders and to victims. Those who defend human rights must be able to access the UN and the Council freely and safely. They must not be intimidated nor suffer reprisals for collaborating with the UN. Uh, with those short opening remarks, I'm going to now turn to you as our audience and ask you to respond to a simple question. Many of you will have been engaged with the Council for the last number of years, the last two, three, five, ten years. And the question that we would love you to answer and, and to put your answers in the, in the chat to is this. For you, what is the most significant achievement or the most memorable achievement of the Human Rights Council over the last five years? So what's the most significant or memorable achievement of the Human Rights Council in the last five years? As I said, really invite and encourage you to put your answers in the chat 
uh, our communications team is then going to do an analysis and prepare a, a word cloud platform uh, so that we can share with each other our insights as to some of the council's most significant uh, and memorable achievements. Before uh, um, commencing with, uh, with addresses from uh, the, the outgoing and incoming presidents, we are also going to take advantage of this online setting and um, bring a diversity of voices to this event. For that purpose, we've put together a video uh, to highlight expectations for the Human Rights Council and hopes and expectations of the presidency in 2021. Uh, the video is a compilation of short messages from civil society organisations and activists from around the globe. I'd invite you to enjoy it with me. In 2021, we want the Human Rights Council to be accessible and accountable to rights holders all over the world by making remote participation possible for all, not just a few. Accountability, transparency and participation must extend to the UN's budget crisis. We call on states to pay their contributions and demand that civil society be updated and consulted every step of the way. To address situations on their merits, and pay more attention to countries with grave human rights concerns and violations to avoid further deterioration. Presidents of the Human Rights Council have increasingly confronted incidents of reprisals against human rights defenders who engage with the Council. We hope that you can further strengthen this practice. We believe attention should be given to countries where the Assistant Secretary General has identified patterns of reprisals, including Saudi Arabia, Egypt and China. To address human rights issues that have aggravated during the pandemic including the situation of prisons, the situation of migrants, and other increased social and economical inequalities. We also encourage the Council to actively work to prevent the advances of authoritarianism and discriminations of all kinds. To hold Russia accountable for its increasing domestic repression against dissenting opinion, and for its role in spreading ill democracy and supporting authoritarian regimes who are committing human rights violations across the region. The Council and your Presidency must also continue to support international investigative mechanisms to hold Belarusian authorities accountable. Likewise, the Council mustn't stop calling for the release of Crimean Tatar human rights defenders, journalists and civic activists in Russia-occupied Crimea. To hold states accountable for acts of reprisals against human rights defenders. Terrorism should not be instrumentalized to criminalize human rights activities as it is widely done in Saudi Arabia and in Egypt. Saudi activist Lujin al-Hatlou, detained after having engaged with CEDAW, and Patrick Zaki, detained for his research for the Egyptian NGO EIPR, should be immediately released, along with all the other political business. To proactively implement the commitments, this would include ensuring allocation of adequate resources for their realization nationally and holding each other to account in their commitments. To defend the life, freedom, the dignity and equality of every man and woman in troubling and challenging times. To ensure that the rights of its LGBTIQ citizens are protected along with every other human right under its mandate. To establish a new prestigious mandate on human rights and climate change, and to recognize the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. To ensure that people on the front line of human rights across the world, the journalists, the activists, the environmentalists, the human rights defenders, the colleagues, can be heard and can engage so that human rights violations can be addressed by the council with the full participation of those who are most affected by them. Thank you very much for all those civil society actors and human rights defenders uh, who shared their thoughts and aspirations with us. Um, I'd now like to turn to the former president of the Human Rights Council, uh, Ambassador uh, Elizabeth uh, Tihi Fisselberger, 
to um, ask you uh, for some of your reflections on the year that was, and also to t take the opportunity to, um, to thank and to congratulate you for the extraordinary uh, flexibility, uh, adaptation, uh, and the steps and measures that you put in place to ensure uh, the participation and the safety of civil society actors throughout the pandemic. Ambassador. Thank you very much uh, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm sorry if I missed something because I had a number of technical problems, but now I'm, I'm with you and I can hear you very well and see you very well. And I would like to start by thanking ISHR and the HRC net for giving the president my, and myself the opportunity which nobody else gave us, not, not even the Human Rights Council itself, which is to do some kind of takeover, handover of presidency. Um, so thank you very much for inviting you. I remember when we had this reception last year and it was so much nicer, so much more inspiring to meet civil society in person rather than on the screen, but that's not an option we have this year. And I'm sure this meeting will help us to do some kind of stock taking of what happened and some kind of looking ahead into the new year, which is still quite new. Madam President, dear Nas, you had uh, what I would call an interesting start into the new year and into this new assignment. Interesting in the Chinese sense, which also means a little bit uh, not exactly what you might have wished for because we kept you waiting for a long time and then you had to hit the floor running. So it isn't too late now to congratulate you on this new function and to underline what you yourself said yesterday, which is that your election certainly is a huge tribute, not only to the important and very specific roles played by smaller and less resourced countries, like those in the Pacific, but also a tribute to multilateralism at a moment when we very much need it, all of it. We know from experience, because we're small ourselves, that smaller countries have less resources, but by the same token, they also happen to have quite a good sense of the bigger picture because they don't have so many people to run around. We know the Human Rights Council is in excellent hands this year, and as we have already seen yesterday, it will not necessarily be an easy year. So this is exactly what we need. The pandemic means that the situation at the beginning of the 46th session of the Human Rights Council is even more difficult than it was at the 45th session. Uh, and even though there is a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel, there is still a financial crisis that the UN somehow has to cope with. I thought the whole of the last year really was a roller coaster with a lot of moving targets. And I'm afraid this year is not going to be very different. Uh, but in spite of all the troubles, we managed to keep, keep the ship afloat last year with the help of everybody. And I'm sure this will be possible this year again. We shouldn't forget the Human Rights Council now has a reputational advantage, I would say, which is that it was the first body in the UN system to take up work again after the first lockdown. And it was the only UN body which really completed its full program of work in the last year. And I think this reputation will have to live up to again this year. Uh, it is one of my hobbies to collect quotes. I reread what I said a year ago, at the ISRH uh, and uh, HRC net uh, reception. Um, and I came across this quote by Nelson Mandela, which I had used, and I didn't know how prophetic it was going to be because Mandela said, everything always seems impossible until it is done. The Human Rights Council is a man-made forum of exchange, uh, about all the problems and issues surrounding human rights. It is not flawless, as our American colleague said yesterday, but nothing that is man-made ever is flawless. So we just have to try together to improve it and to keep it going, whatever it takes. And this is where civil society comes in. Civil society is an important source of information. It is a filter. It is, in a way, a seismograph for what is going on all over the planet. NGOs have a grassroots perspective that governments don't have. They know what's going on on the ground and they have their very own way of accessing people in a way that government representatives never could. A civil society is therefore an important driver of making human rights happen on the ground. 
and they remind governments of their unfinished agenda in that area. Who am I to tell you that civil society encounters a lot of ups and downs? It is not always easy, but the overall stock taking uh, of what we have been doing over the last year certainly shows that civil society helps us to, to write what we call the good human rights stories, the stories which wouldn't have happened without your relentless endeavors. I would therefore like to pay tribute to your work, encourage you not to get bogged down or put off too easily. I know that not all human rights organizations are the same. Uh, some, let me say, are more helpful than others, but that's life and we have to deal with that variety. All through the last year, I realized that human rights organizations, civil society often serve as some kind of fire alarm for the UN system. As they see the early warning signs and they start discussions, which maybe other stakeholders wouldn't start at a particular moment in time. I therefore really did my best to guarantee space for civil society in spite of all the new mod modalities we had to invent. I also tried my best to make sure that no reprise or not a single one went uncommented or unobjected to. It doesn't always mean that you can solve these situations easily, but you shouldn't let go. You shouldn't allow them to fall into oblivion. And that's really what I tried. I do realize that the working situation is more difficult for civil society than it may have been in the so-called normal times. Uh, what I think we can all do together is collect good ideas that might help to make your work as easy, as smooth, and as efficient as possible. Um, I saw last year quite a bit more than one usually does of the nuts and bolts of that huge machinery that the Human Rights Council is. Uh, it's a wonderful machinery. It comes with challenges all the time. But I think together um, we, we can make it. And that's what I would really like to wish to everybody for this uh, year, which is still new, as I said, a lot of courage, resilience, and unwavering confidence in that machinery and in its benefits. And I said I like to collect uh, quotes. One of my favorites is by John Lennon, who said, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. I think this is about the only prediction which is safe to be true for the coming year. We'll, we're in for lots of surprises, but together we'll make it. This is what I wish to all of you, in particular to Madam President, and I'm looking forward to working with you this year. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for those remarks. Uh, now, um, before handing to the new President, Ambassador Khan, I understand um, that we may be in a position to share the word cloud. So I'll just let you take take that in for a moment or two. Um, we will also share this word cloud uh, on on social media at the conclusion of this event, so that you have more time to uh, to 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 analyze it. Um, but some very significant accomplishments and achievements from from the council there. Uh, I'd now like to hand to the new president of the council, a Ambassador Khan, uh, who I'm very pleased to welcome as the council's um, first elected president. Uh, it's also been very gratifying, uh, uh, President, um, in speaking to a number of delegations that, um, that a, a major factor contributing to your election was consideration of the role that you have played in uh, promoting accessibility and participation of civil society and the role that you've played uh, previously as Vice President in addressing issues of reprisals. Um, and that's certainly a role that we look forward to you continuing to play in a very uh, principled and, and consistent manner uh, as president of the council. Um, so now turning to you for some of your thoughts on the year that lies ahead. Uh, you're, you're on mute at the moment, president. And good afternoon to you all and Bula Vinaka, as we say in Fiji and the Pacific. 
Thank you so much for organizing this event. Um, thank you particularly to ISHR. Uh, I also attended your previous events uh, and they've always been a really good opportunity for discussions about what has occurred in the past year and expectations for the coming year. So it's an honor to listen to you all today and also to present to you some of the issues that I think are going to be particularly important and those issues that we would like um, as, as the presidency that my team and I would like to deliver this year as our priorities. Thank you for the kind remarks uh, by Her Excellency Ambassador Elizabeth Tihi Fesselberger. Thank you, dear Elizabeth. It's an honor not only to be here with my predecessor, but also with a friend. And thank you so much for, uh, for your welcome. And you're quite right, we were not able to have a proper handing over. So this may be the handing over. So as you all know, we now have a fully functioning bureau. Uh, with the election of the ambassador of Bulgaria from the Eastern Euro European group yesterday. And now the bureau is made up of the ambassadors of Sudan, Netherlands, the Bahamas and Bulgaria. And of course, as I said yesterday, it is also the first time that there are two small island developing states ambassadors on the bureau uh, with Bahamas and Fiji both on the bureau. And it really is, I think, a matter uh, of great celebrations for small island countries, which have always struggle to have their voices heard anywhere in the world uh, to both be on the Bureau. So this is, uh, this is something which uh, we are very proud of. The main priority, I think, uh, for the, the presidency this year is to drive the council towards greater inclusivity and accountability. And that also means ensuring that the council remains relevant for everyone, including rights holders and duty bearers. In addition to that, of course, what makes our job particularly challenging this year is the fact that the global crisis does not show any signs of abating and that where we were able to have hybrid sessions in the council last year, the fact is now with the very strict restrictions of the Swiss authorities, we cannot have um, more than five people in a room at one time, which means in effect, the council must operate virtually for the foreseeable future, at least. So this is a test of the resilience of the council. And we must do all we can together to make sure that the council continues to fulfill its mandate and remains relevant and effective. We heard this several times from delegations yesterday. And one of the most compelling statements I heard yesterday is that you know when things are difficult, when the entire world is facing this global health emergency, uh, how can we uh, fold our arms up and give up just when the world needs us most? So I think that really is the most compelling um, request and expectation for the presidency. And certainly the, uh, this presidency, as was the, pres was the case in last year's presidency, is determined that the council should continue and should be able to continue with the sessions as close to normal as possible. So let me move on to the role of civil society. One of the reasons why the council is such a unique creature and is not quite the same as any other is because of the contribution of non-government organizations and civil society organizations. I often call the, the voices of civil society on the council, the conscience of the council. So apart from being an early warning uh, signal, as uh, Her Excellency has just said, I think it's also the resilience of the council is also linked to the fact that civil society groups are able to have a voice and are really able to express views that perhaps we may not hear because of the rules of diplomacy from anyone else and certainly not from, from states. So I value the voice of civil society. I would like to ensure that we continue to hear it loudly and clearly. And I would also like to ensure that those who do speak at the council or cooperate with any of the mechanisms of the council should be protected from reprisals. And of course, quite rightly, uh, moderator, uh, this is something certainly even before the presidency, Fiji as a country in Geneva has been uh, very committed to and of course is a member of the core group uh, for the reprisals resolution. Let me turn to uh, in-person meetings because this is a difficult issue. On the one hand, delegations say that 
when we're forced to participate virtually, somehow our voices are not heard in the same way, which is probably true in certain respects. And on the other hand, other delegations, and particularly those from small island countries and those who, who cannot journey to Geneva on a, on, at every session, they say that in fact, virtual participation has enabled better participation, not only of small island states and LDCs, but also uh, the participation of NGOs and CSOs, particularly from the grassroots and from countries uh, where um, the actual human rights violations are occurring. So these are the, the two sides of the coin. And I would say that virtual participation in a way is a double-edged sword. It works very well and it does enable better participation in some requests, but when we have it, then there are many, many complaints about accessibility and about the technology and whether it's working effectively and whether in fact it continues to, to give voices and, and ensure the accessibility of the council. So I know one of the questions from the floor will be about this, so I will come back to the point, to this point, but I do want to say that I personally consider it unfortunate that we cannot meet in person uh, in the Palais as we did in the past. There is something about informals, side events uh, being conducted in person, which can never be substituted uh, by technology. But nevertheless, we are faced with circumstances over which we have no control. And if we are to ensure the effective continuance of the work of the council, then we must adapt to virtual participation and be as flexible as possible to ensure that everyone's voices are heard. So um, virtual platforms for informal meetings. We are fortunate that UNOG has confirmed that they will provide access to a WebEx platform that was provided last year and that will be continued this year. But in response to the complaints of some delegations, especially the smaller ones, that uh, it's very hard to access this platform and they need some help to do it, UNOG has also prepared a user guide which will be made available on the extranet. I believe it already is. So um, for virtual um, consultations, of course, it's not the best scenario. And naturally, most pen holders would have preferred in-person negotiations. But actually, as I said yesterday, we have a choice. We either have virtual negotiations or we have no negotiations at all. So if we are to request the council to consider, consider resolutions, then we must embrace virtual uh, participation and negotiations as effectively as possible. And if there are technical glitches, to point them out as quickly as possible so they can be resolved. And that, uh, that is certainly going to be the case of the 46th session. And unless the restrictions are lifted in the near future, will probably be the case for the next session as well. One of the areas that, um, attracted much discussion yesterday was the virtual participation of NGOs. And of course, we know that the, um, the modalities will include the part virtual participation of NGOs in interactive dialogues and panel discussions, and of course, the UPR adoptions. But then the question arose yesterday of the general debates. And because uh, there are so many, the possibility of so many video statements uh, for NGOs at the general debates, it is proposed by Bureau that one of the new modalities would be to limit the participation of NGOs through video statements in up to three general debates. Um, and that was simply because of the large numbers expected and, and, the, and the fact that the, the Secretariat will really struggle to um, upload all of the video statements unless there is a limit to the number that NGOs are able, um, able to submit. So perhaps that is something when we open the floor, I would be very happy to hear your views about that, to see uh, what your thoughts are. But again, many of you were listening to the discussions yesterday at the organizational meeting. So you would have heard the views expressed on, on this issue. On the modalities generally, um, most of the modalities that we discussed yesterday are not new. They were adopted last year. And without too much of a fuss in, in the end, although um, I was very interested to hear the intervention of Her Excellency, the previous president, who said, well, no, there was a long consultation process and there were lots of complaints, but we got there in the end. And that, 
gave me a great deal of encouragement to know that the fact that there are objections at this stage does not mean that we're not going to get through this and we are going to get CNET members. Um, the first intervention will come from Shamini Dasni Kalamutu, who is the Executive Director of Forum Asia, uh, which is a, uh, a membership-based organisation of NGOs working across Asia, uh, together with uh, the Senior Advocacy and Research Officer of Defend Defenders, Estella Kabatwezi. Uh, so starting with you, Shamini. Thank you, Phil. It gives me such great pleasure to be addressing you today on behalf of the Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development of Forum Asia. 
a regional human rights network with 81 member organizations across 21 countries in Asia. Forum Asia congratulates Fiji and Ambassador Nazad Shamim Khan for being elected the president of the Human Rights Council this year. We are particularly encouraged by your comments yesterday, Ambassador, at the organizational meeting of the 46th session of the Human Rights Council to express your commitment to supporting and protecting civil society and civic space at the Human Rights Council. I would also like to extend our heartiest congratulations and thank yous to the former president of the Council, Her Excellency Elizabeth Tihi Fisselberger, for your excellent conduct of the Human Rights Council in 2020 amid the unprecedented challenges created by the ongoing global pandemic. My sincerest thanks also to HRC Net and the Internet, um, International Service for Human Rights uh, for the wonderful organizing of today's event. I would like to draw your attention to two quick points I have uh, to share with you today. First, the protection of human rights defenders, and second, the importance of continuing civil society participation in HRC events. Firstly, reprisals against human rights defenders who cooperate with the Council and human rights mechanisms is a primary challenge to civil society participation in the Council. Arguably, one of the main reasons for the lack of Council's attention on some of the grimmest human rights situations in Asia, such as Kashmir, Papua and West Papua, is the very real fear of reprisals against human rights defenders who advocate for the Council's attention on these situations. Reports on reprisals by the, Secretary Gen by the Secretary General have pointed to how many are from Asia, including by members, member states of the Council. This remains a serious threat to the legitimacy and effectiveness of the Council. Thus, Forum Asia calls on the President of the Council to use every tool at your disposal to take urgent action on all acts of reprisals and without exception. Secondly, as Asia still lacks a robust regional human rights mechanism, the HRC and the UN human rights mechanisms remain the only viable avenues for redress and accountability when states fail to uphold their human rights obligations, as they often do in Asia. Here, our member organizations across the region rely on Forum Asia to bring their voices to the Human Rights Council and other UN fora. 2021, as we've already heard, will be a crucial year for the Human Rights Council. How the Council responds to multiple human rights crises across Asia alone, including but not limited to the military coup in Myanmar, pervasive impunity in Sri Lanka, the repressive legislation and policies introduced by governments across the region on the pretext of mitigating the COVID-19 pandemic or stimulating post-pandemic growth will be crucial indicators of the Council's legitimacy, effectiveness, and relevance in this current context. Thus, the continued meaningful participation of civil society is crucial for the Council to be able to respond to this multiplicity of human rights crises in a way that is responsive to the needs of the people who are living through these impossible times. We urge the Council Presidency and other member states to ensure that the extraordinary modalities for civil society participation during the pandemic are not are exclusive, I'm sorry, to this context alone, that they, that they do not become normalized or set a precedent for further long-term limitations on civil society participation. Finally, to connect the two points that I've made, allow me to refer to the Secretary General's call to action for human rights launched in March 2020, which indicates that restrictions on civic space, as well as attacks on human rights defenders, and I quote, is frequently a prelude to a more general deterioration of human rights. As we have witnessed across Asia, from the Philippines to India, from Myanmar to Sri Lanka to Cambodia, civil society and human rights defenders are often the first targets of governments in their push towards more authoritarian policies. The Council should take restrictions on civic space as an ominous early warning sign of impending human rights catastrophes and take urgent preventive action. To conclude, allow me to once again congratulate Ambassador Khan 
on her appointment. Ambassador, your participation in this event today is a strong signal for your continued willingness to engage with civil society. Forum Asia stands ready to support your role in what we know will be an impactful year in the Council under your leadership. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Shamini. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to hand immediately to Estella from Defend Defenders. Estella. Thank you, Phil. Uh, once again, I appreciate ISHR and the HRC Net for putting together such a wonderful event. We do welcome the election of Ambassador Nazhat Shamim Khan as the current president of the Human Rights Council and also appreciate the contribution of the outgoing president, His, Her Excellency Tihi Fieselbach. I hope I did get that pronunciation right. Uh, quickly address um, two issues. Uh, one, on the impact of the Human Rights Council and the role of civil society in strengthening the Human Rights Council. For many African countries, the domestic justice mechanisms are inadequate or ineffective and individuals often look up to international mechanisms like the UN Human Rights Council as an avenue to demand accountability for human rights violations that are perpetrated by state actors. Defend Defenders particularly endeavors to make the voices of human rights defenders heard at the Human Rights Council level ahead of sessions when preparing for advocacy asks and documents during sessions and also after sessions. Therefore, action by the Human Rights Council has an impact at the country level. We see it in our everyday work. Resolutions, statements, and debates in Geneva send a range of messages to both governments and civil society in the countries concerned. The Special Procedure Mandate Holders Act as the eyes and ears of the Council and collaboration and exchange of information is vital for human rights defenders and organizations. Particularly, the Human Rights Council serves as a protection mechanism for human rights defenders at, at risk. We have seen interventions of the Human Rights Council provide increased protection for individual human rights defenders at risk, particularly from this part of the sub-region, when cases of concern are raised and the Human Rights Council responds to them. The universal periodic review mechanism of the Human Rights Council in itself empowers civil society and bridges the gap between state actors and their citizens. It allows for civil society actors to demand for fulfillment of human rights as by international standards that respected states committed to fulfill. Due to its unconfrontational nature and out of fear of detest for naming and, sh and shaming, states are more open to engaging on this UPR mechanism. The Human Rights Council's impact is strongest when human rights defenders and organizations at national level have been consulted, have fully participated in formulating Now, we seem, seem to have lost Estella, um, so perhaps uh, I'll move on to the next uh, segment um, uh, and we can return to Estella if uh, she, she reconnects. Um, so the next segment is, uh, is questions and answers for um, the, the current and the former president. Um, perhaps we'll start with uh, questions to the, the current president. Um, I should say at the outset, uh, thank you very much to all those who've submitted questions both uh, through the Q&A function uh, currently as well as submitting questions in advance via Twitter and email. Um, obviously, we won't have the chance to, um, to ask all of the questions of the, of the, the, the current and former president, um, but we will certainly undertake to collate the questions and transmit them to, uh, to, to President Khan um, as an indicia of some of the things um, that at least from a civil society perspective are considered um, important that, uh, that the, the, the presidency and bureau turn their mind to. Um, so uh, perhaps I'll, I'll foreshadow with you uh, at least three broad themes that have, have come out in the, in the questions submitted, uh, President Khan. Um, the first broad theme relates to uh, civil society participation, unsurprisingly. Uh, the second broad theme relates to the role of the council vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And the third broad theme relates to the role of the council vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, very happily, uh, as you've um, uh, implored, focusing very much on the, the, the substance. Um, so perhaps I'll, I'll start with uh, some of the questions that have come in around civil society participation. Um, the first is 
that given Fiji's strong commitment to combat reprisals, um, how do you plan to respond to allegations of reprisals that come to your attention? Um, the second question uh, in respect of civil society participation comes from the, sex the Sexual Rights Initiative, um, which asks as to your plans to ensure that civil society organisations are included in consultations on the modalities of Human Rights Council sessions um, uh, and ensuring that civil society organisations are updated and consulted on the impact of the UN's budget crisis on uh, Human Rights Council work and the uh, efficiency measures. Um, and in a similar vein, uh, the um, Project on Organising Development, Education and Research, PODER, um, asks as to your vision and what steps you will take to ensure that the voices of affected communities and groups um, are heard at the council, particularly given um, the technological gaps and deficiencies um, that uh, many of these affected community and groups need to deal with. Thank you very much indeed. And perhaps I could start with um, reprisals. So uh, as I've said, um, just a, a, a short time before, um, Fiji is continues to be in the core group. So even before the presidency, um, I was very connected to the issue of reprisals in relation to the ASG's report on reprisals, which of course um, is presented to the council um, and is almost always quite um, a fiery session really um, because countries are named and so on. But in relation to the role of the president um, and reprisals, I feel that the way that previous presidents have approached reprisals is particularly valuable because it's a combination of quiet diplomacy and accountability. And um, I think that in addition to the ASG's report, it's a very valuable mechanism of the council. It also makes it very clear that the president is personally responsible for protecting um, human rights defenders against, against reprisals. So very important that I carry on in the traditions of the, my predecessors. Um, and uh, also very important that the Human Rights Council continues to hear from the ASG on reprisals regularly and is able to debate the issue. It's an important mechanism because it does bring out uh, to, for uh, scrutiny uh, allegations of reprisals from all over the world and in relation to many countries. Um, that was the issue on reprisals. The uh, second issue was on modalities and um, how we are to ensure that um, civil society has a role in the efficiency process and also in discussions about modalities. Um, the the co-facilitators who are about to be appointed uh, for the continuation of the of the efficiency process will will be conducting uh, consultations as they have done in the past. And in those consultations, of course, civil society will be invited and will have an opportunity to make uh, representations as they have done previously uh, in a very valuable way. And, and I think and, and they have shaped um, the consequences and the results of the efficiency process so far. So it's very important that you continue to be involved in that process and that you attend the what will now be virtual consultations. But also in relation to modalities, as I've said, I look forward to the um, discussion with civil society on Wednesday to see what um, specific uh, focus discussions you have on modalities. There was an earlier concern that the, any limitations to civil society representation as a result of COVID would become set in stone. Can I assure you that they will not? Uh, certainly not this year. We are dealing here with a crisis which means that no one can come in person. And this is really unprecedented. And we have emphasized over and over again that the modality is extraordinary and only for the 46th session. And as soon as the restrictions are lifted, we will try to maintain um, what we had before and as quickly as possible. So may I please reassure you uh, on, that, on that point. Um, just a comment on digital um, accessibility. Uh, grassroots and human rights defenders uh, from countries where um, it's less difficult to travel uh, to Geneva. 
May I say this, that if you are communicating uh, from a remote region um, and you're doing it by video statement or, or some other way, um, then you don't have to come to Geneva, you don't have to make an application for a visa, you don't have to find uh, money to pay for the airfares and so on. So in a way, it's more accessible. But it would be a mistake to ignore the fact that there is a digital divide in many developing countries and that access to the internet continues to be a struggle, not just for uh, marginalized communities, it, it, it continues to be a struggle for, for women, for instance. Uh, so not all women in a developing country may have the same access to smartphones and the internet as the men of their community, even if there is access. So the digital divide is real. It is a human rights issue. And undoubtedly, it is going to affect the ability of everyone to access the council if they wish to do so. So I'm very aware of that. And we want to continue to have discussions on the effectiveness of the technology that we provide. Uh, at the organizational meeting, there was some discontent with the platform that's been provided by the Human Rights Council. And so there is a need to discuss what the concerns are. But even if we were to ignore those, those, um, those concerns about interpretation and delay and points of order, the fact is that not everybody in the world has the same access to the internet or the same access to technology that allows them to send video statements. So uh, I'm aware of it, um, it's very important, but having said all of that, there, are, there is also a very strong view that in providing a virtual platform, we are maintaining greater accessibility of the council. So in the future, whilst there can never be a substitute for in-person uh, interventions, I believe that because virtual interventions and, and Zoom interventions allow for access to the council by people who ordinarily would not be able to come to Geneva, I think it would be an important um, provision, an important um, process which, uh, which needs to be looked at to see whether it is a way in which we can give better access uh, to those who cannot travel. I'm sorry to go on for so long. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, President. Um, as uh, as I foreshadowed, um, there's also a number of questions that have come in from uh, various stakeholders regarding uh, the right to environment and a climate and, and climate change. Um, uh, one comes from the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to environment, uh, David Boyd. Uh, others come from a number of civil society organisations. And, and to summarise, they are as follows: um, Has the time come? for the council to formally recognize the right to a healthy environment? Uh, and is that something that you hope to, will be achieved uh, during your tenure as, as president? Um, and what is the ongoing role of the council in addressing climate change and its many human rights dimensions and implications? So very important questions, both of them. And if I can address the question from a special rapporteur on the right to a healthy environment, of course, whether the council accepts um, a global right to a healthy environment is going to depend on the member states of the council and whether or not they accept such a thing in the form of a resolution or a decision either by consensus or by a vote. And of course, the presidency always respects um, the decisions of states and the process. However, it's very clear that more than 100 countries in the world now recognize the right to a healthy environment in their constitutions. And so whether, whether there is a global treaty for the right to a healthy environment, the fact that domestically many countries are enforcing this right, and it becomes a very important form of litigation. And of course, those who are opposed to it, and there are several countries which are opposed to, to uh, a global and international recognition of the right, say that we don't want to create any new forms of accountability on climate change and in the environment, other than what is provided for in the UNFCCC. So I think that's an important uh, opinion, and it is going to be an opinion that is expressed in the Council. It must be uh, respected. It is a very valid opinion that there are other ways in which you respect that right. But having said of all of that, the Human Rights Council also has made incredible progress on recognizing the right, informally as well as formally. 
And the core group on the right to healthy environment has been very active in this regard. So again, I say it depends on the member states, whether they accept this or not, whether there's going to be any movement on it, whether the core group is going to take it any further this year. It depends on all of that. But you, you cannot deny the fact that internationally there has been incredible movement in this area. And of course, um, it, it does, in fact, provide a ground for litigation. There's no denying it. Because once you put it in your constitution and you have an enforcement provision, then you will allow people in your community or in your country to take this matter to court. So it is, in fact, um, a huge step uh, to be considered. And I look forward to discussions on this uh, in the council to see where, where this goes. But obviously, as the president, uh, I look forward to the discussions, but I cannot say at this point where, it, where it's going to go. On the uh, relationship between climate change and human rights, I mean, this is even more anguished a discussion in many ways, because some years ago, people didn't see the, the relationship at all between climate change and human rights. And uh, when I was involved in the UNFCCC um, climate change negotiations, this was actually a very, very difficult topic for many countries who again saw it as a new form of accountability that was not in the Paris Agreement and was not in the Convention on Climate Change. But there has been so much progress on this particular relationship here in Geneva. So the pen holders of the resolution on climate change and human rights every year um, negotiate a resolution which demonstrates the relationship, either in relation to persons with disabilities or in persons with the rights of, the rights of children. So increasingly the Human Rights Council has come to respect that relationship and has come, and all of these resolutions are passed by consensus in the Human Rights Council. So there now is a growing consensus that there is a close nexus between climate change and human rights, that the Human Rights Council has a very important role in furthering this relationship and this conversation. And I don't think there's going to be any backtracking. And in that regard, also in Geneva, there are a number of countries which are members of the Geneva Pledge, which are committed to furthering this in an informal, on an informal basis. So they have meetings to discuss how, for instance, uh, Geneva and, and Bonn can have a better relationship. I'm sure this is going to be an ongoing relationship for uh, discussion for some time. But the fact is that there has been progress. And I think there will continue to be progress. Secretary General of the United Nations says that climate change is the biggest threat to the planet of our time. So it would be extraordinary if the Human Rights Council did not discuss climate change. And it has, and it does, and the resolutions are passed by, by consensus. So I think that's an enormous achievement for the Council. And I'm sure that this year too, the discussions are going to be very important and very interesting, and a discussion that we still haven't had in the Human Rights Council formally, um, is this the, the, the relationship between climate change and COVID and, and how that is affecting, for instance, the ability of countries to deliver on their adaptation plans and mitigation pro processes um, while struggling with dealing with COVID. It's, it's a very important conversation and the way that human rights are impacted in that conversation, I think, is going to be a priority for the Council, I'm sure, for several years still to come. But an important conversation, I feel very proud that the council has taken a very strong role in this. Over to you. Well, thank you. That's a very good segue to the, the, the last set of questions to you for the moment. Um, the questions come from, from Human Rights Watch and the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, among others, relating to, to COVID-19. Um, and in particular, uh, interested um, as to whether there is follow-up action envisaged uh, after the adoption of the presidential statement last year to ensure the High Commissioner has an ongoing role in monitoring and reporting on the human rights dimensions of COVID-19. Uh, that's from Human Rights Watch. And then the Global Initiative on ESC Rights uh, makes the point that access to COVID-19 vaccines is a really crucial issue for protecting the right to health, the right to life and many related uh, rights yet many states continue to impede global access to vaccines through their actions or inactions. Uh, what concrete action might be taken by the council to address that issue? Uh, you're, you're on mute again. I'm sorry, that, and that is a, that's a question for me specifically again. Yes, 
Okay, so um, we already know that the High Commissioner has prioritized work on COVID-19 and human rights. There is a focal point on COVID-19 in the Office of the High Commissioner. Um, and uh, there's already much work done on it. So the, the missions here have all been uh, sent questionnaires about the important steps taken by their countries to ensure that work on COVID-19 in their countries is human rights conscious and inclusive, and that there is a relationship between uh, producing on the SDGs and COVID-19, which of course, when the SDGs were negotiated, no one could foresee that we were going to have COVID-19. So there is no doubt at all that COVID-19 has changed everybody's plans for the implementation of human rights everywhere. And the fact that the High Commissioner's Office has really responded to this emergency, immediately appointing a focal point and immediately getting a study out on COVID-19 and, and human rights is really good news because it means that we are getting this analytical look at the way that individual countries are looking at it. Having said all of that, I'm not sure whether every country in the world has accepted this, this very close nexus between COVID-19 and human rights. And uh, I said yesterday, and I continue to say, COVID-19 has really exposed existing inequalities, not just in relation to access to healthcare, but also now access to vaccines. So we have a, a, an unequal, access around the world, which is clear and WHO has, has spoken about it repeatedly. But then we have an unequal access to healthcare within countries and within societies where COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting vulnerable communities and groups. This is very clear. And whether every country in the world has accepted this and has put in, in, um, put in effect plans to ensure that it doesn't happen, I don't know. But may I say this, that those of us which are used to many cyclones and who, which are disaster pro, at the beginning, when we prepared for disasters, we forgot about the people who were vulnerable. We didn't build for those who were from LGBT. We didn't build for people who were you know, pregnant women, for, for children because we were consulting with people who were managing communities, and that was generally male elders. And then we realized disasters disproportionately affect vulnerable. What we are also learning from COVID. And so therefore, when we build a resilient society and we respond to COVID, it's very important that we bear in mind the kind of strategies that the Sendai framework started. And that is ensuring that you build a framework for resilience, which has a very, very clear eye out for those who are particularly vulnerable. And again, what I said yesterday, COVID-19 has told us how poverty deepens with this kind of crisis. So on the one hand, we have COVID specific inequalities, especially in relation to access to vaccines. But on the other hand, we know that the world is facing disaster specific vulnerabilities. And so let's learn from the disasters of the past. And when we build, and it's very important here that the council has a role in this kind of discussion, together with the Office of the High Commissioner. So it's going to be important to hear her updates on, on COVID-19 rebuilding and resilience, to hear how you are able to build a country after this disaster of COVID-19 and doing it in a, in a way which specifically ensures that those who are particularly vulnerable are at the table and helping to build the policies. We're not talking here about the, the language of victims and vulnerability. We're talking here about the language of empowerment. And this is the only way in which we are going to ensure that COVID-19, post-COVID-19 uh, strategies are going to truly be inclusive and strong. And so therefore we're ready for the next emergency. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, so you spoke about the, the digital divide and, and the extent to which it affects many people, in, including obviously human rights defenders and civil society organisations, um, particularly those in, in the global south. Um, I'm pleased that Estella has been able to rejoin us from Defend Defenders. Uh, she's based in, in Uganda. Um, the reason that she was disconnected before is due to an unstable internet connection, and that's also why she's unable to switch her, her video on. Um, but before going to the, the former president with some questions, I'd, I'd like to invite you, Estella, to, to conclude your remarks. 
Uh, thank you, Phil. Again, I do apologize for the technical uh, hiccup. Uh, internet access in Uganda is still restricted and only accessible through uh, VPN, which also sometimes is quite unstable. So apologies for that. But quickly on um, my other statement was on um, the role of civil society in strengthening uh, the Human Rights Council. I'll quickly um, mention the three points that I had. Uh, we are the bridge between the Human Rights Council and the people on the ground. Uh, the other voice of the Human Rights Council reporting human rights violations and keeping the Human Rights Council informed on country-specific or thematic human rights issues. Uh, civil society enables a balanced discussion on human rights issues as opposed to a one-sided one state discussion. Its role cannot be overemphasized. Um, civil society also has a role to ensure that cross-fertilization of decisions or resolutions passed at the Human Rights Council at national level we have a role to make the Human Rights Council relevant for people on the ground, and eventually this will translate into a stronger mechanism. Chronic and urgent situations of human rights violations must be addressed swiftly and robustly. Civil society plays a key role in identifying early warning signs and pushing states to collectively address human rights emergencies at an early stage before they evolve into crisis. In this regard, states should use civic space indicators such as attacks on human rights defenders and the media, the restrictions to freedom of expression, peaceful assembly and association. Lastly, we stress that civil society should continue to have access to the council. Temporary COVID related restrictions should be just that, temporary, and that any efficiency related measures should not have a disproportionate impact on civil society. Civil society should amplify the call for open space for NGO engagement with the Human Rights Council and its mechanisms. Lastly, we count on you, Madam President, to ensure that our space and ability to work with the council are appealed during this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Estella. Um, uh, now, former president, I might turn to you for some, some questions now. Um, uh, a, a number have come in from, from our audience. Um, you're perhaps, uh, as, as the former president, um, freer to, to, to speak than, than you may have been previously. Um, the first question comes in from, from Christian Broker, and it relates to um, council membership. And she makes the observation um, that, in, in her view, the ambition of, of pledges and commitments uh, made by candidates um, uh, is, is diminishing the, 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 the level of ambition. And she relates that to the lack of competition for, for seats and, and the fact that um, most uh, regions have a, a, a clean slate. They have the same number of candidates as, as vacancies. Um, we saw uh, within the Asia group uh, at the last election the importance of um, a, a competitive election and the ways in which human rights considerations can figure in those elections and, uh, and ensure that um, a state that, that is manifestly unqualified for membership is, is not elected. Um, what can we do to uh, address the, the, the issue of, of, of clean slates um, and do so in a way which ensures that more members um, comply with and uphold membership standards? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, it, it's one, one of the big ones, one of the most difficult ones which have been a subject matter ever since the Human Rights Council was um, established out of the ashes of the Commission which had, had a bit of the membership problem as well. Uh, I have never been among those who say only states which behave wonderfully should be members because that would not be a very relevant committee or, or council at that stage. It's important to have countries on board which have different traditions and different track records, different degrees of political will. And I've always thought myself that if a country which doesn't have such a wonderful track record is confronted by that because of being a member of the Human Rights Council, it's actually much better to nudge them into doing certain things than if you keep them outside and criticize them uh, then they, they feel much, le much less motivated than if they are uh, a member of, of the process of the discussions and everything else. So I'm a, I'm a believer in including all kinds of countries 
and trusting that when they are part of that machinery, they will themselves be encouraged to make improvements here and there, even though not as many improvements as some other countries might like. You're right about pledges and commitments, that there is a development where we hear less and less about those, which of course is a pity, and there is not much we can do uh, about encouraging more countries to become a candidate. I've seen it myself that it's quite an effort to be a candidate. It keeps you busy yourself and your hacker capital and your mission for quite some time. It's huge work. It's also to a certain extent an investment in terms of money because you organize events and you invite people and whatever. But what seems to me the main obstacle to having more candidates in spite of that extra effort it takes is that there might be a kind of stigma involved in if you don't manage to win an election. And I think that's a very present um, reflection which is going on in many countries, maybe in particular those countries where any type of election isn't that frequent and is, isn't that obvious. So what we'd really have to circulate as a message, I think, is that it doesn't matter if you don't get elected. It's not necessarily a punishment or anything like that, although it may have been in the case of, of certain countries. Uh, but let, let's have more of a free competition. How exactly to do that, I do not know. But I think it's a good example if once in a while there is not a clean slate. Um, when we were members, uh, Austria, three years ago, in the beginning, we didn't have a clean slate. So we're really competing with other countries in our region. Uh, then some pulled out, and in the end of the day, it was a clean slate, but we still have that process, which is a good thing. I, I don't have the perfect answer to that question. It's a very difficult question. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so I now have a, a question to you, which comes from the ambassador of Latvia uh, to the Council of Europe, um, who asks, from your experience as president of the council, what advice might you give to the incoming president in relation to engagement with regional human rights organizations, uh, whether that's the African Union, the Council of Europe or otherwise? Well, who am I to give advice uh, to, to the new president who is such an experienced uh, diplomat? But anyway, my experience was you can never consult too much. You, I, I really felt all year I was in contact with somebody discussing something, either in the plenary or in groups or very often bilaterally as well. So you have to be in constant contact with all the players, representatives of state, civil society, the various mechanisms, of course, the High Commissioner and her office, the media. So it's a huge community that you have to, to keep in touch with. And it sometimes feels a little bit like a juggler who has to keep quite a few balls in the air. And surprisingly, they don't all fall down. It's, it's, you, you somehow manage, but um, it is very time consuming. Um, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, we don't have the, the opportunity to, to deal with all questions. Safe to say there's, a, there's quite a number of questions uh, that have come in regarding um, whether and how the council can address country situations uh, that fulfill objective human rights criteria, um, uh, such as China, Russia, Egypt, and others. Uh, I guess that's really a question for um, principled leadership uh, and action by member states rather than uh, questions for the, 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 the presidents. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time, so that's um, all the questions that we have time for. Um, I do want to say some things in, in, in closing the event. Um, the first is to say thank you very much to um, the Permanent Mission of Australia uh, in Geneva for, uh, for, for supporting this event and, and, and making many of the technological uh, aspects uh, possible. Um, uh, and also to take the opportunity to encourage um, incoming uh, member states of, of the Council to pick up the excellent initiative of the Permanent Mission of Australia uh, in, um, in committing to the incoming members pledge, which I know is something that, that, that Fiji, among others, was also uh, very committed to. Uh, ISHR itself has, has also formulated a, a series of recommendations or, or blueprints for states uh, to ensure that it is indeed accessible, uh, effective, responsive and protective in, in 2021. 
uh, our Human Rights Council advocate, uh, Salma, uh, will we'll insert a link in the, in the chat, uh, which will take you to, to many of those recommendations, but they're also uh, available on the ISHR website. Um, before letting uh, everyone go, however, I, I would uh, like to ask one, one more question uh, again, uh, which will take the form of a, a, a word cloud, uh, which we will compile and, uh, and, and, and share via social media. Uh, and the question is, is this, um, what is your key hope or aspiration for the Human Rights Council in 2021? Um, so we've, we've opened up the, the chat to enable you to post responses to, to all panellists and attendees. And the question is, what is your uh, key hope or aspiration for the Human Rights Council in 2021? Um, last but not least, uh, we would also um, invite you to uh, attend our virtual photo booth, uh, which um, will provide some of the, uh, the, 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 the visuals from, from this event. Uh, again, our communications team is adding a link in, in the chat. Uh, you can um, take a selfie if you're so inclined in our, in our virtual photo booth. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and if you do and you consent to us doing so, um, we will then uh, uh, pr prepare a group collage, uh, which again, we can, we can share on social media. Um, but again, I'd really like to take the opportunity to thank everybody for uh, attending. Um, to uh, once more say thank you to the Permanent Mission of Australia for, for sponsoring this event, uh, to thank uh, our civil society partners uh, at, at HRCNet and, and particularly those who uh, spoke through, through video or um, spoke through their interve interventions uh, to share some of civil society's hopes and aspirations for the Human Rights Council in, in 2021. And last but not least, um, to uh, say thank you uh, and um, best wishes uh, to um, thank you to the, the former president and, and, and best wishes uh, to the, the, the new president of the Human Rights Council. Um, we look forward to working closely with you to addressing serious situations of concern, uh, to ensuring that the council fulfills its mandate of addressing uh, the most grave and systematic violations, uh, but also obviously in offering technical assistance and support uh, to ensure the prevention of human rights violations. Uh, and to ensuring that the council remains an accessible, responsive, effective place uh, for victims of violations uh, and for human rights defenders. Thank you all very much for attending this event.